Actually, I'm changing the game's name to Rot Flesh. If you played any of my games from this past year, you might have noticed they all have a similar structure. Tutorial, several encounters of increasing difficulty, and then boss fight. I call this the three act structure, and it's a really easy way to give your game a satisfying arc. Also it fits perfectly on a difficulty curve. However, I'm planning to make my game pretty long, and I don't think a simple three act structure will work well for that, because the middle part will end up getting way too stretched out and won't make a nice gameplay arc anymore. So my plan is just to tack on more act twos and threes to create a sort of bigger picture difficulty curve. Now this structure lends itself to linear games where you have complete control over what order players experience things in, but I'm planning to make this game non-linear. So my plan is to have Act 1 and Act 3s be linear, and Act 2s will be non-linear. So you'll start in a canyon and be railroaded forward while being introduced to the base mechanics. Once you complete the tutorial, you will exit into a wide open area where you can go anywhere you want. Encounters will be placed all over with increasing difficulty based on how far you are from the starting point. Then at the edge of one area will be a gate that can only be opened once you've accumulated enough points from doing quests in this area. After you open the gate, you'll face off against a boss, and once you defeat it, you can go to the next area, which will again be a non-linear area, and the structure repeats itself. This isn't groundbreaking design or anything, it's basically what Borderlands does, but it's a simple, effective way to have a somewhat open world game. Now the next challenge is that I need to place enemy encounters all over the map, and importantly, I need to give the player a reason to actually go and fight through them, instead of just running around them. The obvious solution is to have quests that require you to go and complete these encounters, but that really just means the players will do them once and then never go there again. So I came up with a few more ideas. First, have a chest in every encounter that will give a random item when you open it, but you can only open the chest once you've killed all the nearby enemies. Now players will feel encouraged to actually do these encounters so that they can get rare organs and weapons, and that's great, but what happens when you have an optimal organ setup? You'll feel like you don't really need to loot anymore, especially you won't feel like you need to loot enemy corpses, which, you know, that's kind of a cool part of the game, looting them. It would be shame to, you know, not be encouraged to do that. Now, I could give enemies random unique drops as well, but one thing I've been set on is that enemies should not have random drops, because there's nothing I hate in RPGs more than looting tons of corpses, on the off chance they might have something good. I want it to be that if you kill and loot an enemy once, you'll always know exactly what organs they drop, and then you can use that knowledge when you want to modify your organ setup. But of course, you know, what happens when you've achieved an optimal organ setup with all rare organs, you won't feel like you need to loot those common enemies enemies anymore. So the easy solution was to add durability to organs and just make them degrade over time. They'll have pretty forgiving lifespans like 5 to 10 minutes, but it will make sure that you're always looking for enemy camps to raid so that you can refresh your equipment. It will also force you to experiment and try out different organ builds. For example, if you found a really tanky body fat drop and then when it's about to degrade you loot a chest and find a nice lung instead, you might feel like you should swap them out and you now get to experience being fast instead of tanky. Also to make the common enemies organ drop more valuable, I made sure the special organs have awkward shapes so that you can only fit a couple in your body at a time, and we'll have to pad out the rest of the space with common organs. One worry I had with degrading organs was that the player could get stuck somewhere deep in the desert with no organs, so I sprinkled around the map uh, dead enemies on spikes that you can loot. Side note, to make the game speed runnable, I also made so that when you start a new game, you can define the seed that the loot randomizer uses so that you can have the same chest drops on every run. The final thing I did to make players want to fight through enemy camps was to put save points inside the chests. I wasn't sure how to implement saving in the game. I could do manually saving where you can save anywhere at any time, but one, that's really hard to implement, and two, whenever I played games with that, I found it really annoying because I felt like I needed to save constantly, or I would forget to save and then have to go back like an hour or something if I died. And then the other way of saving would be checkpoint saving, which would also be annoying because I would have to manually place checkpoints everywhere, and it might not be super clear to players when their game was last saved. By having save points in chests, players will always know exactly when they last saved because it would just be the last combat encounter they had, and if they're heading into really dangerous territory, they'll feel encouraged to leapfrog from enemy camp to camp so that they can save more often, and if they die doing whatever they're trying to accomplish, they know they'll respawn nearby and get to try again right away. Also, when you load in at chest save points, it just deletes all nearby enemies, so that way it becomes a safe area. Now onto the actual encounter design. Obviously, I can't get super in-depth with this since I currently only have one enemy type, guy with gun, though I did make so they can also use shotguns and grenade launchers and 
instead of just the SMG, and if they're carrying those guns, they'll have unique armor on to make them more distinguishable. But for the encounters themselves, I've been toying with the idea of mathematical encounter design. Basically, I assign a number to different variables in each combat situation, like area with no cover, 5, lots of cover, 0, cramped and hard to maneuver, 10, enemy with SMG, 1, shotgun, 2, grenade launcher, 3, explosive barrel, negative 2. Now when I design an encounter, let's say it has two SMG enemies, a shotgun enemy, an explosive barrel, and a fair amount of cover, I can just kind of pull values from that chart and then add them up and get a score of like 3 here. And then that will be the difficulty value of that encounter. Now if I reference my difficulty map of the area, I can decide, okay, this part will have encounters of difficulty 1 to 4, this part will have 5 to 8, this one 9 to 12, and so on. And then when I'm designing encounters for each area of the map, I just reference that difficulty map and can pretty easily choose an assortment of enemies and amount of cover that will fit for that area. Obviously, this is a very simplified approach to encounter design, but it gives me an easy way to churn out lots of encounter ideas. All right, that's all for design approaches. Now on to tweaks and stuff. First, I redesigned the enemy's aim logic to actually use math equations and stuff to lead shots. Before, I was just using a hacky, hard-coded approach that broke if I changed the speed of projectiles. With the new techniques for guns that shoot bullets, it's just a simple quadratic equation to solve. But for firing projectiles with gravity, like grenades, I had to do a more complex iterative approach to avoid super complex math involving quadrics, which are something I had never heard of before researching this topic. The approach I took just calculates the angle to fire a grenade at to hit a target, then it gets the time it would take the grenade to reach the target, calculates where the target would be at that time if it stayed at its current velocity, and then re-aims to fire the grenade there, gets the travel time again to that new spot, sees where the target would be at that point in time if it maintained its velocity, then re-aims to that new point again, and then just repeats this like five times, which gets you close enough for a grenade to be effective. I'll put some links in the description to the articles and blog posts I read while researching this topic in case you're interested in learning more. Now obviously having enemies that are 100% accurate wouldn't be very fun, so I've kept my old accuracy algorithm. Basically accuracy starts at zero and increases to one the longer the target, aka the player, moves in the same direction. If the target goes behind cover or changes direction drastically, accuracy is reset to zero. At accuracy one, enemies will perfectly lead shots, and at zero they just aim directly at their target. So this forces the player to zigzag and run around cover a lot to throw off enemies' accuracy, which I still haven't found the right balance between projectile speed and accuracy increase rate. It's either too easy or too difficult right now, but it's also a lot of fun when it's really difficult because it makes the enemies really dangerous, and the fights actually feel like a desperate struggle where you have to use everything around you that you can to your advantage so that you can win. Um, so other stuff I did, I improved performance a bunch by doing boring stuff like object pooling. One interesting thing that I did was to put all the enemies' pathfinding calculations on a different thread. Those calculations were taking a lot of processing power and this was an easy way to fix it and it's okay to have the pathfinding calculations on a different thread since the enemy's path to the player doesn't need to be 100% accurate every frame it just needs to get them nearby. So the way it works is I have a pathfinding manager singleton and NPCs will send it path requests for a start and end position. The pathfinding manager will put each request into a queue and go through them one at a time and each time it completes a path request it will remove it from the queue and send the new calculated path back to the NPC that asked for it. I also added in decals. I wasn't planning to do this until Godot 4 release because that will have a native decal implementation, but then I heard Godot 4 isn't releasing until July and I want to release this game before then, so I just pulled this decal asset for Godot from GitHub and used that. What's interesting about this implementation is that it uses a cube projection technique where it paints a decal on everything inside this cube mesh, meaning if I drop something in it, the decal will paint over it, which is kind of annoying but not super noticeable most of the time. Also, if you put your camera inside the cube, it stops rendering so I have to make sure that each decal mesh is thin enough that the player's camera can't go inside of it. It also doesn't have the best performance right now, but I've been working with Chase on Twitter to make some improvements to it, and we'll probably make a fork with our changes soon. I'll put a link in the description for that when it's done if anyone's interested. By popular demand, I also fully implemented the third person mode. The challenge with it was that if you just move the camera backwards, then your character's head is in the way of what you're aiming at, and if you move the camera to the side, your character is no longer aiming at the center of the screen. The solution I did was to raycast from the center the camera and have the player aim at whatever point the raycast hit. Also, I am now objectively better at this than AAA Studios. Whatever's in front of the camera gets shot, which is why the light behind me reacts whenever it's in the way of my crosshair. 
In a previous devlog, I mentioned the bandit enemies take a drug called Killfuck that they loot from the crashed spacecraft, and it improves their reflexes and stuff and makes them better at fighting. I got a lot of requests in the comments that you should be able to take it as well, and I also got some people suggesting adding a bullet time mode, so I figured I'd just combine the two suggestions. You can now pick up and take Killfuck, you can carry a max of 5 right now, and when you take it, time slows down, camera FOV widens, audio pitches down and gets distorted, and this all follows this curve, which makes it kick in really suddenly, and then fade out towards the end so you have a warning when it's about to end. I also made more 3D graphics for spacecraft rocks and re-added in these iron meteor shards that were in the old version of the game and they look way cooler in first person. If you're wondering why there's so many crashed spacecraft it's because there was a massive space battle that was fought in this system decades ago and there are now thousands of derelict military spacecraft floating around and the gravity well of a nearby gas giant pulls them into the path of this planet so they're constantly falling to the surface where bandits loot them for military hardware to sell. Finally I made a ton of bug fixes tweaks and added in a main menu and pause menu where you can do the usual stuff like key bindings and audio controls and also by popular demand added an option to disable camera tilt when you strafe since I was making some people nauseous. Another tweak I made was to make reloads complete a fraction of a second before the animation finished since I found myself constantly switching a little too soon and having to reload again when I switched back. I also made so that you can right click organs to auto equip them since it gets tedious to drag and drop them all the time. And that's all for this devlog. If you want to play the game, back my Patreon, 5 bucks a month, you can get access to the demos, I upload new ones every few days or so, I stream development on Twitch every day also, so follow me there if you want to see that, and if you want to learn how to make a game like this, check out my Udemy courses linked below. Also thanks to my mod Satin, he made this custom keyboard for me, he did a build video for it as well, I'll link that below.